So um, I actually wasn't given much of a brief for this. So it was uh, a question about, you know, would I talk about the ups and downs of Nottingham Forest in the Premiership? We'll talk about the MSI program and the sort of work that we're doing. So I'm afraid you get the MSI program and the, the work that's happening there. So um, this is looking at lessons learned and future directions. Um, and it's really looking at how developing Canadian major research facilities. So I'll use the acronym MRF occasionally. And uh, just to preface that this is very much my personal thoughts and based on my personal experience, uh, both in the UK and in, uh, and in Canada. Uh, and I hope there's a little bit of a call to action at the end as well, in terms of what we're, um, what we're doing as a community. Um, so we, uh, shown in the image here is uh, obviously our minister, um, Minister Champagne. He toured Triumph uh, relatively recently, and what you see in the image is him using a, a paper clip to map out the magnetic field on top of our cyclotron. I'm hoping that's the paper clip he uses to attach a check to triumph in several months, which I'll come to. Um, so I've really got three uh, sections to the talk. One is about my personal journey in terms of uh, facilities and some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. Um, then looking at the, uh, the sort of work that we're doing as a community in terms of the Canadian uh, research ecosystem. And then looking also at what we, the, the, the future programs, the future directives. So. Oops. Going back. So this is uh, personal lessons in, in infrastructure. And um, my life has uh, been fundamentally doing research in pretty wild environments, um, you know, finishing up in Vancouver, which is not quite so wild. Uh, but my PhD was uh, actually at the South Pole. And that was uh, at a time when I was doing PV gamma ray astronomy. Uh, one of the things people don't realize about the pole is it's at a very high altitude. It's plus three kilometers. Uh, so there's a really heavy ice pack there, which suppresses. And that was important for our field because we were looking using uh, cosmic rays that reach the ground. So being at high altitude meant we could see the TV gamma rays that we were interested in. And the, um, the, the fact that we were on the South Pole meant that sources just rotate around your head. So there's no possibility of missing a flare or anything like that, which was important in the early days. Um, as Mark mentioned, I wintered uh, 87, 88, that I'll show. I then moved to uh, Imperial College and the UK National Laboratory, the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. And uh, the research there was looking at dark matter, and that was based in a salt and potash mine in the UK and uh, North Yorkshire in Whitby. Uh, so that was about minus 1.1 kilometers. And uh, you'll see that temperature is a theme here. So at the South Pole, the coldest I experienced was minus 71. Uh, in, the, uh, in the UK lab, it was generally plus 25. We had it up to plus 45 at one point when the air conditioning failed. And then 2009 moved to Snow Lab, um, which is in Sudbury, so just over two kilometers deep. And that's plus or minus 40, depending whether you're underground or on the surface in the season. Of course, I realize I don't need the unit there. Right, plus or minus 40. Um, it's or minus 40 is Fahrenheit. So uh, this is the infrastructure that we built at the, uh, in the Antarctic. So the dome, uh, we didn't do that. That was, uh, that was the uh, Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station that the US runs at the South Pole. So that's at the intersection of all of the claims to Antarctica, so it's a very important place to be. Um, we, I built a telescope as part of a small team. Um, that was in 87, 88, and wintered over in 1988. So one of the comments that I often put to graduate students at Triumph, you know, for worrying about doing night shifts, I did a night shift for my PhD. It just lasted six months, right? So when people complain about night shifts in Vancouver, I don't have too much, uh, yeah. Um, the results were actually inconclusive, but the lessons that I learned there uh, have certainly stayed with me. And safety and uh, PPE, is obviously a key part of work in Antarctica. So that's uh, in the winter, you know, when you're uh, working outside, you're wearing probably about 20 kilos of weight of, of uh, clothes to go out into the minus 60. Uh, and so having the appropriate equipment, having the appropriate safety systems, the ability that when I went out onto the plateau to go to the experiment, I needed to know that my team had my back was another part of the, uh, the message as well. Team dynamics are essential, was another major lesson for me at that point. You know, still doing my PhD, but there were 19 of us there for the winter. And when you're isolated, uh, and the middle image 
is dear to my heart. That's the Hercules aircraft that left the South Pole around about Valentine's Day. And then the next one comes back about Halloween, which I always find quite funny, but about Halloween, they come and get you. Uh, so knowing that you can rely on your team is absolutely essential. And you know, before we went down, we had a psychological uh, test, and they never told us whether you sent people who passed or failed. And I couldn't actually tell that year, to be honest. So, uh, but you know, the team was essential. Uh, the other aspect was having backup plans and solid risk management. Uh, an example there would be if the generators went out in the pole station itself, we had a backup out in the, um, the summer camp, and if that went down, we had a backup out in uh, basically the middle of nowhere. So if there was a fire on station, they can't come and get you, so you're on your own. So you have to be able to have this backup plan and multiple backups to make sure that you can uh, address any risk. And that's a, that's a message you know, when all three generators are out, and you're wondering what you're going to do for the next four months uh, before the electrician finally gets the thing going again. You know, that teaches you risk management is essential. Um, OK, so that's Antarctica. That was my PhD. Um, moving then to Bulby. Uh, this is a working salt and potash mine in North Yorkshire. And uh, this is a working mine. The lab is at 1,100 meters depth. And the personal lessons there, again, you're working in a uh, um, you know, basically an industrial environment, so PPE and safety continue to be essential. That's a common theme in my life. Uh, teamwork is really essential across diverse groups. And this was important because you rely on the mine. So a lot of those systems, again, you're working with miners, uh, you're working with the mining community in that area. You need to know, uh, basically, the way to communicate with them. They don't have PhDs in physics. You know, they have different drivers, so you need to be able to work out how to communicate to a team to get the best out of them. Uh, it was also clear in terms of a common goal for the facility that that was critical for the, uh, for the Bulby lab to make sure everybody was driving in the same direction. So having that strategy and that vision was uh, certainly important. Uh, the infrastructure needs to be appropriate to the program. So when we started at Bulby, of course, most of our money went into the science. And you'll see on the right image, that was the infrastructure that we put in place. It was basically, it literally was a shed from a DIY store and a tent. And an early version of me working on one of the really expensive detector systems. Um, <clears throat> you know, my boss uh, came underground and basically said, this is just inappropriate in terms of the infrastructure that you have. So you know, we had to go to government, make the case, and we were lucky enough to secure funding to uh, develop a, uh, another facility shown on the right, uh, which lasted 10 years. And that was uh, a second lesson in terms of maintenance of the facility. Not a lot we could do about that because we were underground and it was crushed, which uh, was quite startling for those who watched it in real time. Um, but yeah, the facility required constant maintenance to be able to um, maintain the infrastructure. So being appropriately resourced to run the facility and requiring constant maintenance. Okay, then based on the uh, work at Bulby, I came over to, the, uh, to Canada, to the Snow Lab, and uh, Snow Lab is you know, one of the early CFI MSI programs. Um, it's managed as a joint venture between the five Canadian universities shown there, with Queen's as the lead, funded through the MSI program in the province. And again, it's in a, a, an operating nickel mine. Uh, I was there for 12 years, and the sort of lessons that I picked up there, other than that a lot of experiments in physics are, are spherical, that seems to be one of the key lessons you learn, uh, is that strong governance and support and oversight is really important. So building accountability into the system is a critical part for a large facility. Uh, again, obviously we're underground, so uh, the safety protocols are really uh, important. Um, a relatively new area for me was the regulatory compliance in that when I was in the UK, a lot of that was done by the Rutherford Lab. Uh, at Snow Lab, we were doing that ourselves. So making sure we're compliant with all the regulation for working underground, for the construction phase, manufacturing, and so on. So having the ability to undertake that compliance angle was critical, and having the resources to do that was critical as well. Uh, having that diverse team, again, working with a, a broad community to deliver the program. Um, a phrase I'm using a lot at Triumph is operational excellence and the ability to make sure that you are delivering 
a support structure for the community that you are uh, that, that you're supporting and uh, taking a lot of load off them so that covers things like the regulatory compliance but now we're of course in the um, worrying about things like geopolitics and cybersecurity and the ability to you know, just as we we're discussing today uh, in terms of who can actually use the facility so a lot of uh, questions that need to be maintained by the uh, by the uh, major research facility uh, infrastructure maintenance and deliberate talent development, I think, are other key lessons that I learned there, is making sure you have that pipeline of, uh, of talent. Okay, so that's, that's my personal background. A lot of the lessons I picked up along the way, which you know, you'll recognize in, in the facilities that you're operating. Uh, so switching to Triumph, just to give people a background about Triumph, um, we're Canada's Particle Accelerator Center, and uh, there's about 600 staff and students involved. We were founded in 1968 by the three local universities, which is UBC, Simon Fraser, and the University of Victoria. Uh, but it was, uh, before the ink was dry, Alberta joined. And Triumph stands for Tri-University Meson Facility, so thankfully they didn't change it to FUMPF to include Alberta. Uh, what's shown there is the main facility hall. So the yellow, um, which is the uh, iconic Triumph uh, color, that's shielding brick, so that's shielding the radiation. So basically that's concrete uh, that is used as shielding. Um, <clears throat> so we have, uh, this is where Triumph sits. We, we have our campus uh, uh, is at the south end of the, the UBC campus. Uh, this is a typical day in Vancouver, never rains ever, right? So feel free to come and visit anytime you like. Um, and we have 21 universities from coast to coast as our members. We uh, changed our governance structure relatively recently from a joint venture into an incorporated company, and that's actually had a dramatic difference in our oversight structure and our governance structure. And I think it's dramatic in a beneficial way. So we, um, we have a, a members council where all of the universities have representation, but we now have a skills-based board where before it was two members per, um, per university, so it was a board of 42, which by default means it was dysfunctional. Um, the board now is 11, so it's a skills-based board with the university representation. So it's, um, you know, it's much more engaged in what we're doing. It's much more engaged in the oversight, and it gives us, uh, it gives us that credibility in terms of the, um, the governance structure that we have. There's about 50 PhD uh, scientists, so you'll see in terms of the number of uh, staff, many of, it, many of our staff are engineers and technicians. And that relates to the talent pipeline and the benefit that we can have for Canada in terms of developing technical capabilities within Canada, not just the uh, PhD level support. The core of um, Triumph is an 18 meter diameter cyclotron. Uh, this is a particle accelerator where um, what's shown here, uh, the magnet coils. So these are 4,000 tons of steel. Um, it was built by a ship company in Quebec and one of the things we have at Triumph is a ship's wheel, which always confused me till I understood that you know, once you finish a job as a shipbuilder, even if it's a cyclotron, you give the client a ship's wheel, which is a bit odd, but yeah, we have a ship's wheel. Um, and it's the largest conventional cyclotron in the world. Its diameter is 18 meters. And the way that uh, it works is this, this is the magnet structure. We inject H minus ions in the middle of the structure. They cycle in the magnetic field and we have an electric uh, structure that gives it a kick every so often, so you're accelerating these particles. Um, they spiral, and then we kick them out. And in the 18 meters here, the particles will travel about 40 kilometers and get to about three quarters of the speed of light. And we then use those particles either for um, slamming them generally into targets so that we can look at radioactive ions, extract the radioactive ions, and do things with them. Uh, so the core, um, I like this photograph for a couple of reasons. One is, um, if you look at the, the shape of the magnet coils out towards the edge where the particles are moving faster, you can see the effects of special relativity in the design of the magnet coils, which is pretty cool. And the other reason I like this is it shows that since 1970s, health and safety has moved on. So rather than having planks at the bottom as a way to get on and you know, people up in the air, uh, we wouldn't allow this anymore, unfortunately. Well, no, fortunately. Right, definitely fortunately. Scrub that. <laughs> Okay, so um, initially, as I say, it was very much a um, uh, uh, nuclear physics 
program, but we have broadened that into particle physics, into cosmology, astrophysics. Um, but we have now a suite of accelerators, and uh, we have two linear acceler electron linear acceler two linear accelerators on site, and about half a dozen uh, cyclotrons for protons. And the main accelerator, you can see the, um, the spiral down at the bottom. Um, but we have developed uh, <coughs> the science that we're doing into different areas. So we're now looking not just at uh, nuclear and particle physics, but also material science. And one of the key areas that we're moving into is the production of medical isotopes and the ability to research different medical isotopes. So you'll see um, at the bottom one of the beam lines, it's labeled beam line 1A for those close to the, um, the screen. At the end of that beam line, there is an isotope production facility where basically we dump the, uh, the hydrogen ions into a thorium target. That generates lots of radioactive isotopes and we extract things like actinium. Um, and to look, uh, yeah, actinium and lutetium, things like that out, which can then be used for uh, medical imaging or medical therapy, as I'll show. Uh, to the north uh, is the ISAC area. That's generally looking at things like nuclear astrophysics. How do we create metals in supernovae? How do we create metals in neutron star mergers? So understanding nuclear physics in those sort of processes, those sort of extreme processes. Um, and we study the ions themselves. So... One of the things that amazes me about Triumph is, so it was initiated in 68, first beam was in 74, and we're still using a 50-year-old infrastructure uh, at cutting-edge science. So that shows one of the aspects of Triumph is the ability to maintain the infrastructure and uh, keep it going. And that's a key challenge that we're facing today. So Beamline 1A is 40 years old. Literally, the concrete is crumbling. We need to work out how to get support to upgrade and refurbish that beam line. Um, and you know, the, process, the opportunities that we have at the moment aren't sufficient to allow us to do that. So maintaining infrastructure is an issue for us and uh, for, you know, for uh, basically all of the MSIs as well. Um, the funding model <coughs> is shown here. We have uh, about two thirds of our funding is flowing through the NRC, but we are a line item in the budget. Uh, so we are funded in five-year tranches. Uh, our, next, our current five-year tranche uh, finishes uh, in March 2025, but we're, as I'll show in a minute, we're in the process of trying to secure funding. And uh, I think this is uh, another area where we're identifying that um, the Canadian system needs work. So we are a line item in the budget. We're sunsetted. So every five years, Basically, the question is, are you done yet? And we're a 50-year-old program, you know, a 50-year-old facility. Of course, we're not done. And one of the things I didn't pick up is that we've just in, we're just coming to the end of building a $250 million upgrade to the, uh, some of the accelerators. Uh, that's a decadal program that's taken 10 years, basically, to get built. It will come online in 2026 and 27. Right, so these long-term programs that we're trying to achieve, there's a mismatch in terms of the funding that is, uh, that is possible for us. Um, another key point for, uh, on this funding model is 18% of our funding is private. That's generally um, for supporting the medical isotope production. Um, so the free energy in that is not as, not as great as you think in terms of what we can do with the money. Much of that is already committed to operating some of the smaller cyclotron. Um, but yeah, overall, uh, we're about $100 million a year operation for those 550 staff plus the uh, research that, it's, that we support directly at Triumph. Overall, uh, one of the things that we tried to do um, for this funding cycle was to demonstrate we can't go through this five-year cycle constantly. And so we put together a 20-year vision with the community. This was an 18-month process. Uh, where we looked at what, where the community wants to take us. And this diagram is um, you know, sort of summarizing that. You'll see in the center the core capabilities that we have at Triumph around accelerators, detectors, data science. That's the stuff that makes us attractive for uh, an international audience as well. And so we have uh, interest from the US for the electron ion collider that's being developed at Brookhaven because of some of the capabilities that we do. That's an important message to government, that the ability for us to basically project um, Canadian expertise, Canadian know-how into the international arena. 
Um, so you'll see uh, the, the general work that we have working clockwise from the top, nuclear physics, particle physics, cosmology, dark matter, nuclear astrophysics. Um, they've been around forever. Uh, the material, molecular science, um, has been developing. Nuclear medicine is definitely a, uh, a burgeoning area as well for us. And then the three areas that we added deliberately around innovation and impact to show the benefit of what we're doing. And then green and quantum technologies. Uh, we're already doing quantum technologies with quantum sensing. And we're already doing some projects around green. But we needed to really be deliberate about this to show the strategy that we were taking so we can articulate that to government. And then between the uh, core capabilities we have, the enablers are the talent that we develop the operational excellence and having a diverse um, research environment. And in terms of diversity, um, this shows the scientific users and visitors, and it's a fairly even distribution. Nuclear physics is still um, a very broad group of, work, of users that we have coming to Triumph, uh, but you'll see quantum materials, particle physics, and the commercial side are relatively uh, large as well. So having that multidisciplinary aspect, I think, is a strong message to put to government, that we are connecting many communities. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to give you a specific example of the medical uh, isotopes, because I think this, this relates to the way that we communicate to government in terms of the benefit of what we're doing. Uh, I mentioned the medical isotope production, and one of the uh, isotopes that we generate is called actinium-225, and it's an alpha emitter which is basically a helium nuclei. And alphas are very destructive, but they don't go very far. So if you can get this alpha particle into the tumor of a cancer patient, it's very destructive in the tumor, and it doesn't kill the, uh, yeah, the rest of the, uh, the cells around the tumor. Uh, what's, shown on the, uh, what's shown on the left is the um, result of a... Um, a trial that was done in Germany, and uh, this was only possible because in Germany they have different laws. So I think this is another area where being able to articulate the benefit of what we're doing to government to change policy is also very important. Um, so this is uh, an unfortunate gentleman who had prostate cancer, and um, the image on the far left, the image on the far left, is uh, a scan where you're looking at metastasized prostate cancer throughout the body. So all of the black except the organs are the, are the cancer. Um, after four applications of actinium-225 using PSMA, which is um, prostate-seeking something or other, um, that's, the, that's the protein that latches onto the, onto the tumor. Um, you can see that fundamentally the guy's gone into remission. On the image on the left, he basically had two to three weeks to live. Right. And this put him into remission. He lived for an additional four or five years and died eventually. Complications, but not related to, the, to this cancer. It's an amazing te potential technology. And I think this is one of the areas where you know, Triumph is fundamentally a research facility. It's fundamentally populated by nuclear physicists. But we have to tell the story of the sort of work that we can do as a community What's the benefit to society? What's the benefit to people? So the, uh, the other image is uh, a similar sort of trial um, that was done, uh, again, using actinium-225 uh, for pancreatic cancer. So for certain cancers, this looks like a really promising uh, avenue. And we're currently in trials um, with a pharmaceutical company uh, in the UK and uh, Norway using a, um, a commercial partner. Okay, so that's, that's Triumph um, and some of the work that we're doing and some of the lessons that we're applying. So, you know, to summarize those lessons, I think um, MRFs are national assets for Canada. That's, that's the phrase that I use constantly when I'm talking to government. We're operating on the international stage, you know, we're projecting Canadian expertise. Um, Canada is unique in the world in the way that it does major research facilities. Uh, the academic research facilities are very bottom-up driven. If you look around the world, uh, there are different models that people use. So uh, the GOGO model, government-owned, government-operated model, is often ubiquitous in, in Europe. This is where facilities would be part of you know, government research, in, um, research facilities, for instance. 
the GOCO model, one that is familiar uh, in the US, where it's government owned, but it's, it's actually contracted out to a, you know, either a university or a, a commercial partner. Canada is using a sort of COCO model where for the, for the facilities that are academic orientated, they are owned by the universities and they're operated fundamentally by the universities or contractors. So the government connection is actually quite loose at that point. Um, obviously, this is, uh, this is referencing um, yeah, the MSI program. Um, Canada has GOCOs, so Chalk River uh, Canadian Nuclear Labs is a GOCO. Uh, AECL own it, but CNL operate it. And uh, we also obviously have GOGO as well in terms of some of the um, departmental labs. So the labs that are operated by agriculture or NRC, uh, they, are, they are the GOGO model. But the academic connection is critical. And that's something that we underplay. The fact that, you know, I talked I talk to the, um, Joe, the head of uh, Chalk River, and he's really envious that Triumph has this 21 university network. We are able to access the academic environment much more readily than, uh, than he is in, in, a go -go, uh, in his case, in a GOCO model. So I think this is something that we also need as a community to really demonstrate that this is something that's important for the government to understand is that the labs that we're operating, the MSIs, are fundamentally um, are very useful in the research ecosystem because they connect academia to industry and government. So the, uh, the COCO model that we're, we're operating you know, it has benefits in flexibility. Uh, it has benefits in terms of the research community engagement, but it has challenges at scale. So as you get larger and uh, you, know, you move into something the scale of you know, the larger MSIs or Triumph, it's actually very difficult to um, engage in a funding model that, uh, that is really supporting the, the lab. So there are many models, uh, as we heard today, in terms of uh, the MSI program. So mileage may vary, but I think the fundamentals in terms of the lessons that I've taken are that large research facilities are actually very similar in the challenges that they face because we rely on people. People do the research. And so providing the support structures and enabling staff and users uh, to really do their science, to excel in their science, is essential. That's actually the, the commonality that we have as a community. Uh, obviously, you want to do that within accountability. Uh, you, know, you need to make sure that people are doing things safely and uh, are compliant to regulations. So some of the fundamentals that I've uh, picked up are you, know, you need an appropriate governance structure for the scale of the project. Uh, it's essential for the healthy development of the facility. The transition at Triumph, as I say, was really helpful in terms of connecting the university through a board. Um, and the board structure, of course, for a not for, not, as a not-for-profit means that the board is invested in Triumph's success, not in the individual university's success, but the success as a collective. Uh, applying a, appropriate oversight for the scale of the investment. One of my issues at the moment is uh, fundamentally I have two oversight structures. I have the National Research Council, steward of the public money, and I have the internal governance structure. And, you know, that's killing us. Last year we had 44, meet, 44 uh, meetings or um, engagements where we had to report, and that's 44 in one year. So that takes quite a lot of effort from a handful of us to maintain that. So I think that's an area, again, where you know, trying to ensure that whatever structure um, follows, hopefully something like the MRF, there is an appropriate oversight structure. Uh, risk management is critical, and that's especially on core infrastructure to ensure you don't hit a crunch. Um, you know, and one of the challenges, I think we all realize, getting something new is often easier than upgrading existing infrastructure. Um, I see Bill smiling. <laughs> I think that's a commonality between CLS and Triumph. Uh, operational excellence is something else that I think um, is often underplayed. So when, when times are hard, there's a temptation to put money into the science, and that has to be resisted because you know, when times become constantly hard, it means that you're fighting against a system that is not supporting the research. So that's you know, going back to my fundamental, you're trying to support people. But to do that, you need to make sure that you're compliant, that the research security is in place, the cyber security is in place, you know, all of those aspects. So having operational excellence is uh, certainly a mantra that I'm driving at, uh, at Triumph. You can, of course, sustain for a short period, you know, cutbacks in those, but you can't do it for a long period of time. 
uh, nurturing talent and embracing the pipeline. By the pipeline here, I'm referencing the, the talent pipeline. Um, I think one of the, one of the aspects that um, we have to recognize as publicly funded organizations is that we, we are part of the research ecosystem, but we cannot um, retain everybody that we train. So we just have to recognize that you know, we need to train people under the understanding, especially as we heard today, you know, PhD physicists are relatively easy to attract to Triumph because of the research, but the technical support, the technical certified, the engineers, those are the individuals that we have to recognize. We're not going to hold them. Right? We are going to attract them because of the challenges we give them. They're going to learn, and then they're going to be moved on. You know, they're, they're going to see opportunities that we cannot compete with. We have to embrace that. We have to just recognize that that takes a little bit more effort, a bit more time from our perspective. Uh, a key lesson, of course, is demonstrating relevance to the funding uh, structures, whichever funding structure we're in. Ensuring that you have diversity of teams and structures, again, uh, you know, I think the work that we've been engaged in, both at Triumph but also the underground labs, demonstrates that you need a wide pool, you need that diversity. And you know, obviously you've got to do great science, but I think this is one of the, uh, you know, getting a bit of heat at Triumph, because I'm just assuming the science is world class, because it's got to be, otherwise they wouldn't get funding to do the science at Triumph. And this gives me, you know, I'm getting a bit of heat for this because I'm focused on some of the other areas like operational excellence. Um, and then a phrase that um, I've heard a couple of times today about punching above our weight. We need to be careful with that phrase. You can only do that for so long. And Triumph's an example where we're now in the ninth round and the heavyweight's about to flatten us. Right? So we need to you know, be in a situation where we're able to ensure that we can secure sufficient funding. Um, so switching to you know, thinking about future directions, some of, the, some of this has obviously been picked up in reports over the last few years, uh, well, many years, including Naylor, including the Bouchard report. And uh, one of the outputs from that that's being discussed is something like an MRF program. And the, uh, the mismatch between the bottom-up driven and the mission-driven approach, where you need some strategic thinking, you know, what are the infrastructures we're going to need in 10 years? What are the infrastructures we're going to need in 20 years? That has to be done at a strategic level. And so the, uh, the concept in um, you know, coming out of things like Naylor and Bouchard is the concept of an MRF program where the full life cycle of a national asset is uh, evaluated and understood. And that really requires a change in culture and approach from the research community, from us, that the true cost of an asset has to be factored in. It then needs a change of approach from the funding agencies and government because we can't scare them when we actually say this is going to cost you so many you know, hundreds of millions over the life cycle of the project, but we're doing it on a stage basis. So I think there's certainly work to be done there in terms of that discussion. Um, the MRF, the MSI are often forgotten as a component of the research ecosystem and you know, I was reminded of that twice in the last week week and a half, um, the Hill Times had a pull out on innovation. It didn't reference the MSI, it didn't reference the MRF. There was a Globe article from Naylor and uh, Stephen Toops uh, on Saturday, and although they referenced research institutes, they didn't reference, again, the MRF type of institute. Right? So we are oft forgotten as a component of the research ecosystem. I think that's terrible. I mean, I think we are a component that really has a lot to offer to Canada. We sit at that interface of academia. Obviously, we grew from academia. We sit at the interface with academia, government, and industry. And you know, the, the government labs, the GOCOs, they do not. So I think we have a unique platform that we should be promoting strongly to government, that we have a role to play in this research ecosystem, and getting out there and banging the drum. You know, I absolutely, passionately believe that the MRF are national assets. Yeah, you know, say it on every slide that I put into government, basically. Yeah, you know, we are national assets, and we have to be viewed as national assets by the federal government. And I know that part of this is because you know, university sector comes from a provincial perspective, but we have to make that bridge for the government that we're national in scope and international in breadth. And uh, I think that's a key argument that I'd like to you know, encourage everybody to make. So it, it requires a bit of a shift from thinking about the MRFs and the MSIs as you know, university institutes to treating them as what they are, 
you know, they are national platforms that really help uh, develop the, uh, the research ecosystem. Um, you know, as shown here, the, uh, so the assets, you know, the MRF sit of that interface. Um, I think some of the um, experience that we've had going through the funding process um, for Triumph has really demonstrated that some of the arguments um, that are landing. And one of the um, surprise, well, maybe not surprising things is that science doesn't factor heavily in this. Right? And I think this is something that, um, certainly with my research community, it's taken a lot of effort for me to persuade them that that's actually the case. The government doesn't care about certain cross-sections occurring in supernovae. What they care about is what the individual who's been researching that is going to do and the impact, the return on investment overall. And I think that argument is often a bitter pill for many of us to swallow because we were brought in, you know, we're energized by the science. We shouldn't lose that energy, we shouldn't lose that enthusiasm, but we have to just moderate the direction that we're discussing. Uh, so I think the, um, you know, the example uh, of Triumph funding, these are some of the things where we've landed uh, really good arguments. Um, the development of essential and sought after expertise in key areas. So for us, it's accelerator-based technology. Medical isotopes generated with accelerators. We need people who know how they work, how to develop them. Many of the accelerators in hospitals are using a Triumph-based design that is now uh, being manufactured by ACSI in, in Vancouver. Um, a, a key one, and I can't stress this enough, is the talent and the training. Uh, you know, driving the attraction. People come into science because they're energized by the science. We have to train and recognize that we're not going to retain everybody, but we want to hold them in Canada if possible. So creating that national pipeline that I referenced. Uh, for Triumph, as I mentioned, we have a couple of investments, $250 million of investment over the last decade that is going to be coming online in the next couple of years. So the return on investment, on existing investment in infrastructure, has also landed well, uh, as has the socioeconomic return, you know, the, the, the medical isotope story, the IP creation, the spin-offs, um, the ability to, uh, one of the techniques that we develop for um, uh, muon tomography, so using cosmic array muons that Snow Lab hides from at shallow depths, you can actually use it to map out the density profile of the rock around you, which is interesting if you're a uranium mining company, right? So you can actually uh, make greener mining by uh, basically getting a, a mapping using AI of the, uh, of the ore body using a uh, smaller number of, of um, boreholes. Um, one that uh, I think has also landed extremely well is resilience on a national scale for technical capabilities. The MRFs, the MSIs, are capable of pivoting quickly. Um, that's not necessarily true in government labs. And that's an area, again, that has really landed well with government. And there are examples that we can demonstrate. So during COVID, of course, the vaccine production, you know, during, when, when the pandemic hit, uh, you know, the border walls came down. Canada didn't have that capability initially, and it you know, took a bit of time to ramp up. Uh, some of the, the physics labs, Snow Lab Triumph, were involved in developing a ventilator from uh, a, a dark matter detector. That sort of pivot was only possible because we had the capability in-house, we had the project management, we had the expertise already there. Uh, Technetium-99 is another example from Triumph where Chalk River shut down. Technetium-99 is one of the standard uh, isotopes used in PET scanning. And uh, <coughs> it originally came from uh, Chalk River nuclear reactor. That, re that reactor shut down. Triumph then developed a new technique using cyclotrons to create technetium. So there are ways that you can demonstrate that resilience that we're providing to the country. And then there's the science which is you know, the enthusiasm that you can demonstrate. You know, we, as I'll show, we, we um, were on the hill uh, last week, and we took 15 early career scientists, basically, and it was, a, you know, it was a wonderful seeing their enthusiasm light up the MPs and the senators that we met. I think one, uh, one thing that often surprises people who want to talk to them is that science generally has actually all party support. So when we're on the hill, uh, we had you know, the Liberal, we had the Conservative, we had NDP, we had Bloc, MPs come through, talk to us. Everybody's enthused by science, but the problem is you've got to change the narrative depending on who you're talking to, of course. So it's an issue of understanding. I mean, it's, it's 
communication 101, right? It's know your audience and know why they're interested in what you're doing. I think part of my message here is it's not the science. It's what you can do for the country that is, uh, that is really important. So the case study um, showing you Triumph funding, just to back up that last statement, so we're in, we're in a uh, process at the moment. We are funded in five-year tranches. The last four, four five-year plans are shown here, and the thickness is shown in a photograph as well. Um, so going back to 2005, every single five-year plan delivered flat, flat funding. And it was only after the flat, flat funding was delivered that we then went in and argued the case that we were able to secure additional funding. The initial, but the point I'm making is the initial proposals were all based on the scientific work that we were doing and the great science we were doing. They all landed flat, flat. We need to change the model in terms of the way that we're approaching. And this is the terrifying thing that I'm having to do this time around. We had a major change. and yeah, My research community is very nervous of this. I tell them, if you're nervous, imagine how I am, right? I mean, this is a major shift for the way we're approaching government. And um, what's shown on this slide, uh, if you go to the Triumph website, you'll actually, I've got some hard copy as well if anybody wants one. Uh, on the Triumph website is the five-year request for support. Science is obviously in there, but you'll see the focus is shifted. And the core areas that we're looking at are delivering new infrastructure, those, that $250 million worth of um, investment we've made, ensuring operational excellence, making sure that Triumph can operate and efficiently and cover all of the new areas that we have to do in terms of geopolitics, in terms of cybersecurity, those areas which we, you know, my predecessors did not have to worry about that, I do, and making sure that we're able to demonstrate that. Training the diverse talent of tomorrow, and that includes the ability to attract people. Uh, Vancouver is not the cheapest city to live in, and as people are aware, stipends for students haven't gone up for a long time. 20 years. So attracting students to Vancouver is actually quite challenging. We've had to just issue a policy where we've set a minimum level, and I'm underwriting that with commercial revenue. So you know, when people go back for NSERC funding, you'll see that the Triumph requests are going to be higher because we need to pay people a living wage. We need to be able to get students in below poverty, above poverty. <laughs> Scratch that one as well. Above the poverty line, right? That's the, uh, so that's wrapped into training the diverse talent of tomorrow. But again, the pipeline is something that we're putting there. Uh, refurbishing legacy facilities. I've already mentioned that uh, you know, the Beamline 1A, we failed to secure funding for that. We have had to include that into the request because it's just basic infrastructure that we need. It's a 50-year-old machine. It's not brand spanking new. There's things failing on it that we need to repair every year. And then the science is actually wrapped up in the final statement, Evolving Triumph's program towards the future. The heat map um, <coughs> shows you some of those areas called out, operational excellence. IAMI is our medical isotope. Fac facility utilization is running the main machine. Uh, the domestic research ecosystem, site maintenance, talent training, etc. And what we developed was a heat map to demonstrate the impact of various funding levels. Our request is 450 million over five years. So that's basically a 50% increase from the 300, roughly, that we're getting at the moment. We need that. If we don't get that, you can see the impact that we have. And so what we're articulating to government through ICED, through NRC, we're talking to the Prime Minister's office, Privy Council office, you know, we're basically talking to anybody we can find uh, when we go to Ottawa, literally. Um, you know, the, the impact of a reduced level of funding because of the systemic and chronic underfunding that we have received. I think that's something that everybody will recognize. Everybody will recognize that the system is broken and we need to change it. And sadly, Triumph is first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is, uh, I put this up just to show, well, actually, I put this up to show the Snow Lab team that um, Pietro owns a suit. Um, so this was, uh, was last week, talking to members of parliament, talking to senators. And as I mentioned, there is cross-party support. We just have to articulate it and mobilize that support um, to, to really impact the ability for us. So my last slide is yeah, the call to action. Um, I view MRF as national assets for Canada. We operate on an international stage. We project Canadian ingenuity into the world. 
we've heard great examples today about how MSI are excellent in all the areas that I've been articulating in terms of how government you know, really, um, what government is looking for from research structures, whether it's talent, whether it's that internationalization, whether it's the ability to pivot. Um, you know, all of the MSI have that capability, so a compelling narrative exists. I think greater coordination is actually needed across our community to make that message really land. And this, you know, this is fundamentally a call to this community to support CFI, to make sure that CFI have that argument. Triumph sits outside the CFI mechanism, so we're going directly to government. But I would encourage people where possible to make sure that, you know, talking to whoever you need to talk to, that you are also doing the same. You are connecting with government to make that case. Uh, you know, slicing existing funds can only take us so far. So we really have to secure additional funding. We have to break the model that we're currently working on and move from um, you know, the, MS, the, the MSI program. There is a, a program that is defined. Um, you know, the proposals are made to that program. That's a constraint that we have to break as well. Right? So we are needing to create new programs. And that's unfortunately what Triumph is needing to do now is you know, go from that flat, flat 300 million over five years to a much larger figure. Um, <clears throat> people may be aware that the, the major research facility framework that was discussed in, uh, in Bouchard and Naylor, you know, I said is driving that, and that is one potential approach to look at a more strategic way of funding the MRFs. Uh, but to do so, you know, that requires engagement from all of us, and it requires a coordinated messaging. So that's you know, fundamentally my call to action, is make sure we're sending the same message to government we need to support CFI and ICED to be able to demonstrate the benefits of what we do, not just in the science, but in the way that the, uh, the reliance of the research ecosystem on Canada, we are an integral part of that. So, off forgotten. We've got to get out there and make noise. Uh, we need to make sure that people recognize the MRFs uh, exist and are really important. University engagement, of course, is critical. And, you know, I'm... I have 21 university members. In the last year, I've got to 16 of them. We've got five more to go. I was down in Regina yesterday and uh, talking to FNU about whether they might be interested in joining Triumph as well. So the university aspects are really critical. Um, but university presidents have many priorities. And so the challenge is to be able to articulate why MRFs, why Triumph is an important component for them. And I don't need all 21 member universities, I don't need their presidents to go knock on you know, the Minister of Finance door. I need one or two to at least make that comment. Um, I think the, uh, you know, this takes effort. It takes a lot of effort to sustain this sort of, uh, this sort of outreach, but it's really critical that we, uh, you know, that we collectively do this so that we're maximizing the benefit of the investment that Canada gives us, which is substantial. Uh, yeah, we do great science. We have major impact for Canadians. So my call to action is collectively, you know, let's give CFI, I said, the best possible advantage in achieving where we can go. Thank you. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Do I have to take questions, Mark? <laughs> yeah, if anybody's got questions, I'm happy to take them. Where's dessert is probably the one that... <laughs> All right. Thank you.